Kia ora tato. So my name is David Hall. I am a senior lecturer at the School of Social Sciences and Public Policy at AUT and also chair of AUT Sustainability Steering Group and also um, founding director of the Climate Innovation Lab, um, which works on climate funding and financing. I'm very much looking forward to introducing my guests um, very shortly, Catherine Lining from Motu and Tanya Pofiri um, from the Southern and Western Initiatives. But first, uh, let me acknowledge Ngāti Whātua Arake, um, who has mana whenua on the land on which um, AUT University is based and with whom I'm involved in a wonderful tree planting project down at Pōrewa. Um, let me also acknowledge those who have passed, whose wisdom we draw on to face the challenges that we are discussing today. And also I want to acknowledge um, everyone who is doing it tough in um, Tamaki Makoto today, um, especially those who are fighting off um, this terrible disease of COVID-19 and um, wrestling with those challenges, which we are bound to talk about shortly. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to the Auckland Climate Festival team for pulling this event together under very difficult circumstances. And um, finally, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I invite you to make use of the chat function um, to raise any questions or thoughts you have as we go, and I will try to weave those into the conversation. Um, but if you can all please um, keep yourselves on mute so we don't end up with a cacophony of um, thoughts. So first, I'm, I'm just going to set the scene a little. Um, just transitions is, is a topic some of you may well know that I keep coming back to um, again and again. I've edited a book on the subject on this side, um, A Careful Revolution Towards a Low Emissions future and more recently um, just in recent weeks published a special issue on just transitions for the policy quarterly which is really the um, excuse for today's conversation and why do i keep coming back to this question of just transitions because i'm quite confident that a genuinely unjust transition to a low emissions future is one that is going to be fought tooth and nail by the people it impacts on. An unjust transition is bound to face pushback, resistance, complaint. And understandably so, because the low emissions transition is resetting the foundations for the lives and livelihoods of Aucklanders for decades ahead. And just for full disclosure, I was co-chair for the Mayor's um, Independent Advisory Group for Te Taruke Atafari. Auckland's Climate Action Plan and the issue of just transitions is something that we discussed at length and which I know that elected representatives put a lot of emphasis on because they were getting a lot of feedback um, from the constituents on that, that we need to bring people along on this journey and we need to secure consent for the future that we are creating. And this is also why in my work on just transitions, I've wanted to create conversations um, because I couldn't possibly have all the answers. I bring one perspective to this. He tangata ho. I'm a person of the Treaty of Waikatangi whose um, ancestors arrived in Aotearoa uh, a century and a half ago. And I'm also like many Aucklanders, a recent Aucklander. Uh, my family has long st standing links up here, but I um, was, was born and raised in North Canterbury and T.Y. Ponamu. So have been living here for the last five years um, after living in the UK researching political philosophy. And it's because of that background in political philosophy, I'm very interested in the idea of justice and it's essentially contested nature. Um, to speak of some of the ancestors whose wisdom we draw on, a philosopher Plato put it neatly about two and a half thousand years ago, when anyone speaks of iron and silver is not the same thing present in the minds of all, but when anyone speaks of justice and goodness, we part company and are at odds with one another and with ourselves. 
in other words, justice means different things to different people. There are certainly themes that come up again and again, like equality, legitimacy, fair procedure, restoration, balance, and so on. But these different elements manifest and are applied in different ways in different contexts. And this insight has special relevance when we talk about justice and just transitions in Aotearoa. New Zealand because European and Tauriwi ideas about justice came to this place after Māori ideas about justice, after tikanga, which is what Justice Joe Williams describes as Kupe's law, the original law of this land. And if we are to have justice in this place, it cannot and should not override this indigenous paradigm of justice. And so that's why and having this conversation about just transitions today, it sits alongside and intersects with this equally open question as to what a tika transition might mean. So today's not the first con such conversation that I've been involved in and it won't be the last. And I'm, I'm certainly not presenting this as a definitive conversation about just and tika transitions in Tamaki Makoto there are critical voices that would need to be involved for this to be a comprehensive com conversation, um, in particular mana whenua, Pacifica, disability justice advocates, labor unions, so on and so on. This conversation is, is going to be narrower, but I hope um, a little bit deeper and maybe with a policy oriented bent. Um, but if you do want to um, access some of those other conversations and other perspectives, then uh, watch the space. As I said, this won't be the last conversation. And um, I'll also make some recommendations for books and other readings at the end of this webinar. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my discussants today. Um, firstly, Tanya Pofuri, who has uh, connections to Nga Tuhoi and um, is currently manager community and social innovation at the Southern and Western Initiative at Auckland Council. And I'm especially excited to be talking to Tanya today because she's already doing the mahi of um, equitable transitions in Tamaki Makoto. She's practicing what we preach when we talk about justice, just transitions. Um, you know, the Southern Initiative, one of its key priorities is to see the socioeconomic transformation of South and West Auckland through economic activity, which is inclusive, just circular and regenerative. So we'll be talking about that shortly. And also Catherine Lining, um, Policy Fellow at Motu Economic and Public Policy Research, and one of the Climate Change Commissioners who is overseeing um, the Climate Change Commission's advice to government and its monitoring of government progress. Um, and Catherine has a deep history in climate change policy in Aotearoa, including roles at Ministry for Environment, Foreign Affairs and Trade, and also the New Zealand Transport Agency. So welcome to you both. Um, kia ora, koirua. So Catherine, um, let me start with you and you could unmute. Um, the idea of just transitions has proliferated recently around the world and really varies from place to place. But what are some of the common elements of a just transition? Well, tēnā koto katoa, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for creating the opportunity. Um, I think you're absolutely right. This concept of a just transition is continuing to evolve. And I think there's a lot of creative potential in that. Um, also, the potential for, um, for confusion and, and complexity. Um, in the research that, uh, that I've done uh, with colleagues at Motu, um, the concept of a just transition across the different uses seems to come down to a core element of managing the impacts of climate change and of climate action across the economy in ways that are equitable and inclusive, and in ways that safeguard those who are going to find the adjustment most difficult. Um, the concept itself actually was born out of the union movement, um, looking to support workers who are being affected by environmental regulations. And so some of the core themes were around decent work, environmental sustainability of jobs, um, poverty eradication, and worker and union involvement in decision making. But since then, that worker justice stream has uh, joined a stream of environmental justice, 
looking at how the impacts of, of economic production on the environment are disproportionately um, distributed, and then looking at social justice, um, poverty, um, wealth distribution, um, social rights, uh, racial discrimination, those, those types of themes. So we're not just talking about a single transition, but many transitions and many dimensions of justice. And we're also not just talking about avoiding future injustice, but also taking advantage of the opportunities to heal current injustice by however we transition. Um, I think for me at the heart level, I try to simplify it down to looking at how we take care of each other as we walk through a very rapid and disruptive transition in response to climate change. Um. Yep, care, care is obviously a, a value I take very seriously here with the <laughs> title title of the book, A Careful Revolution. Um, absolutely. I mean, can can you maybe expand on that a little bit? I'm really interested to hear why, you know, how you see that connection between care and the just transition. Um, when people are more afraid of the solution than they are of the problem, we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. And I think we have to be really clear that we are going to take care of each other as we walk through this transition so that we will have the courage to move through it together. And to me, part of taking care of each other is recognizing that our rights are respected and that people's needs get met and that people are dealt with fairly and have a voice in the process. So I think I think all of these things are critical ingredients to to moving ahead on climate action. Yeah, and, and, and that brings up for me, I mean, it just obviously care is about relationships with, with people we're in a community with. Um, and so there is this question about to what extent just transitions should exist in the community. I know from my conversations with the Just Transitions Unit um, that works out of the Ministry for Business, Employment, Innovation, Innovation and Employment, that um, you know, their focus has been very regional in, in working with Taranaki to start off with and, and now Southland. Um, you, you know, do you think that there's a question of scale here about where the just transition ought to sit or can it, can it work at multiple levels? Um, to me, the just transition happens at every level from the level of the individual heart up to the international level. And we really need to be looking at it in all of those ways. It's, it's gonna be a layered conversation um, that, that needs to evolve, um, I think. Uh, this concept of localized transition planning is going to be absolutely critical because a one size fits all solution is not going to work here. Um, at the same time, there are elements of a just transition that are going to need, be, need to be coordinated nationally um, to make the best use of collective resources and, and in some cases internationally as well. And I think that's one of the challenges here is empowering um, people at the local level to craft a transition that works for them and enabling that to be um, coordinated and aligned at the national and international levels. So I, I think this is a huge challenge to governance of policy and, and we're just at the start of trying to figure out how to make that work. I, I think the early efforts to try to do this on a regional level are really, really valuable. We need to learn as much from those as we can and from other um, examples of localized transitions in other areas you know, to look at how we can do this most effectively. Kia ora, Tanya. Um, so the, the, the word tika, is usually translated as um, right, proper, and just. So it seems very relevant to this um, co-papa today. So, you know, if we are to think about a low emissions transition that is tika, a tika transition, what what kind of resonances and what other concepts and values does this bring to mind for you? Well, kia ora, David, uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you for um, allowing me to inflict myself upon the, the viewers. Uh, <laughs> behind the computer. And for me, um, in order for it to be a tika um, transition, it needs to first and foremost do the right thing for the people who have been at the worst end of the extractive economy. There would be no point to simply swapping out, um, you know, um, a transition which, which um, sees the demise of the extraction of the natural world but doesn't do anything about the extraction that happens in South Auckland, for example, which has a very, very large reservoir of expendable brown labour. So it will need to do things, these things, as a singular endeavour. Um, otherwise, we really do run the risk of green colonialism. We leave intact the worst parts of the um, economy. And so, you know, for example, you know, a just, just transition should put down 
rational economic man for once and for all. These things are no good for um, anybody. And so there's a real opportunity here for us to completely regear. And I think um, the first question um, that you always need to ask of economics is for whom? Resilient for whom? Um, trans transitioned for whom? And, there, and that leads you to the next question about, well, what gets valued then? So things like, and just to, to, to take the care um, idea even further, caring, the care economy is inherently low carbon, you know, and it is great for our social fabric. Um, so the people who look after us when we're sick, the people who look after us when we're poor, the people who are looking after our kids, they are an absolutely integral part of the low emissions economy and should be valued as such. And of course, the majority of those people are women. So in my mind, a, a, a tika or a just transition, first and foremost, would need to even the playing field. So it would need to, to lean into issues of justice and why we have you know, over 50% of the prison population is Māori, for example it would need to have that tripartite approach to creating decent jobs. Our biggest challenge as an economy is that we are low paid and low productivity. So how is it going to contribute to um, uh, solving that challenge? We do need to look at health. Um, so in South Auckland, if you are Māori or Pacifica, you will die 10 years before Pākehā and Asians who live next door to you. So this is what this is what all of this culminates in. We just die earlier. So it needs to a, a just transition would need to get its head around all of these things. It would need to get its head around um, the bodily integrity of women and our access to contraception and the right to control our fertility and, and our um, access to things like health procedures like terminations, for example. And then it would also need to really lean, lean into our domestic violence and sexual violence problem. Now, because if we can't have these, these basic controls in our lives, if we don't solve the challenge of poverty and inequality, there is no way. Poor people can't fight climate change, incarcerated people can't fight climate change. Um, and then for me, to dig even further, and who are the, who are the ones who are consistently never at the table? And they are our whānau haua, our whānau whaikaha. So I'll just say, you mentioned um, disability rights activists. Um, they are consistently marginalised by everybody. Um, and lone parents, the only family type with a negative net worth. So there is a, you know, a, a big lift that's needed. And it can't be incremental. On top of that, the challenge is it cannot be incremental. Like Naomi Klein says, we have to leave because we're running out of time. Just as there is a tipping point for um, our natural world, there is a tipping point for people as well. And we're seeing that playing out right now. Our vaccination strategy is not going as fast as it could because we have strained that, that social fabric, that social contract, um, and we've had a slow burn economic disaster happening in places like South Auckland for the last 50 years. And just to uh, just as a quick kind of perspective, um, a quarter of all Māori in New Zealand live here in Tāmaki and 64% of all Pacifica people. Together we are 27% of the population of New Zealand's largest and only international city. We need to be very, very mindful and careful about how we move forward with an economic um, recovery that is equitable, that then dovetails perfectly into a, to a just transition, an equitable transition. Yeah, some of, some of what you said there reminds me of an old um, political slogan, secure people dear. You know, and it's that it's that sense that you know um, the low emissions transition is is a scary, and it requires some daring and some um, confidence to plunge into. But you need that security, and um, you need that stability in order to take the chance and take the risk. And I, I just wanted to also just ask, um, you know, just you, for for you to maybe just to preempt some of our later conversation by describing some of the communities that you serve, because again, we're not, you touched on this, we're not talking about a cultural 
monolith here. We're talking about Matauranga from all corners of Aotearoa. Uh, we're talking about different Pacific communities who bring different ideas about justice and fairness and, and what's right. And, and then Tawiwi from all corners of the globe. Um, and you know, that's not just the story of South and West Auckland. <laughs> that's, the quest, that's the story of Auckland in, in its entirety. Um, so, so again, you, you know, how, how do you sense that these different ideas of, um, you know, aspirations and, and sense of what's fair plays out in the communities that you serve? So um, first and foremost, our communities are just trying to get by week by week, the people who we work with. So actually, we work with a spectrum. We work with Fano who um, um, do everything to avoid the state, and that includes NGOs who, who they consider to be part of the state and aren't accessing things like Fano Water Services, for example. For them, their isolation is the biggest form of protection. And so they they do they guard that really well, um, right through to um, we're in prisons. Um, we're working with populations, for example, young people who are only just hanging on by the you know by their fingernails, but they're not showing up on the radar of the state by being neat or anything like that. But neither are they flourishing; they're yep. just kind of existing from day to day and completely uncapped potential right through to our superstar Māori and Pacifica businesses who are the um, undervalued and overlooked change agents hiding in plain sight. It's really fascinating to me that whenever we're thinking about how we solve some of these problems, our first thought is into social services. It's actually not into how do, how do we back our winners and our, our, our biggest winners are our Māori and Pacifica entrepreneurs who are employing other Māori and Pacifica peoples and from all of our anecdotal evidence of, of the 500 Kamaki businesses that we work with paying things like better wages, are better employers, all of those benefits kind of wrapped up, wrapped up into um, one, one kind of neat parcel. Now they're not a silver bullet because there is no silver bullet yep. and I think that's probably the first thing to, to yeah, yeah, yeah. realize. Um, we need silver buckshot. So, so we'll we'll come back to some of the work that you're doing and on the opportunity side here. But, but Catherine, um, you know, why do we want to make the transition just and and Tika? Why does it matter? Because I think there's definitely some that take the view that if climate change is really that destructive and that harmful, then it is the big injustice. It's the ultimate injustice. And therefore, it shouldn't really matter how the transition happens, you know, as long as it happens um you know whether whether it happens unfairly or inequitably or excludes certain voices you know it's it's urgent it's an emergency we just need to press forward even if it is unfair you know what do you say to that kind of um approach that we just don't have time for a just transition well it's an interesting question i i don't think i've heard that argument as much that we don't have time for a, a just transition i think the issue is more that the just transition looks so hard that people end up not doing anything <laughs> and um so um you know i i think that first of all inaction on climate change does constitute a profound injustice um and and it's to both current and future generations um as well as other species um and i was really excited to see the un human rights council declare that having a, a clean healthy and sustainable environment is a fundamental human right uh that just happened a couple of weeks ago and you know that should be obvious but it's nice to have you know to have it stated as a, as a formality but you know how we choose to act on climate change really matters i mean for starters climate action it's a it's a marathon it's not a sprint and the solutions that we implement have to be sustained so sustaining means social license and social license means social impact, right? So we have to have enduring public support for what we're doing. And if people are being harmed in the process, that support won't be there. But I think this, this issue of climate justice is also about defining who we want to be as individuals and as a society. You know, I was listening to a reflection by Joanna Macy in which she shared that the, most, the two most powerful weapons that we have against the darkness of our time are compassion and the understanding that we are interconnected and interdependent. And to me, a just transition is about mobilizing those weapons of compassion and interdependence and realizing that being equitable and inclusive across all of our communities is necessary for any of us to succeed in climate change. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess we must be listening to different conversations, but I, <laughs> but, but, but I do get the sense sometimes that, um, you, you know, even even planning and strategy or relationship building, that you know, you know, that there's not enough time for this, and there is a sense of impatience, um, especially around some of the climate emergency politics. But I, I, I wanted to ask, just just following up on your question, you know, why. You, you mentioned in your first um, comments that you know some of these considerations have been neglected from policy design, and um, you know one example, for instance, is is the emissions trading scheme and the way that these pricing mechanisms tend to have a regressive effect on um, on households. They tend to weigh heavier on low income households because. Um, disposable, you know, consumable goods are, are a higher proportion of household spending. And, and you know, this, this risk is, is well understood by economists. And yet, in, in our policy design, we still haven't seen those um, solutions being put forward that might be able to ameliorate um, some of these distributional issues. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, you know, do you think that, um, you know, policy designers have been a bit behind the eight ball and and been a bit slow to pick up on some of these considerations and the way that they've designed policy. Well, I mean, I think the overall policy process has been very slow and then the just transition element within that has been very slow. And, and those two things are probably compounding each other. Um, whether the emissions trading scheme has a regressive impact on communities really depends on how the revenue is, is, is used and, and the broader policy context in which the system is operating. And the problem is we've, the system has been operating without the broader context, without the complementary policy measures that support communities to respond to the price. And we've never had a strategy for, for clear revenue recycling from the emissions trading scheme. I mean, the system actually was, was operating you know, without generating revenue um, through intentional design at the beginning, all the revenue was going offshore. So I think we're in a new world now where we've got significant revenue coming in through the emissions trading scheme and can look at how it gets returned to communities for their benefit to help them to adjust to the emissions price. Yeah. You know, we do have a fundamental problem that prices are pushing us in the wrong direction because our, our incentives are, are, aren't right. So we need to help remedy that, but it can be done um, in ways that are consistent with a just transition if, if we do it well. I, I think one of the other pitfalls we keep falling into is design designing policies in a piecemeal process. So we only see little pieces at a time and then they get shot down on, on the grounds that they are have regressive impacts or they aren't effective enough and so on. And I think the hope is that if we get a comprehensive emissions reduction plan in place, it's obvious that even if a policy has a small regressive impact in one area that can be remedied through other solutions that come through so that the package works for communities as a whole. Yep. And we can move forward because, you, know, you know, we do need policies to, for example, to shift transport habits at, at different levels in the population. But we also need to ensure the basic transport needs of all New Zealanders at the same time. And yep. we can do that. It's just that one policy may not accomplish all of that and we don't have the whole picture. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I just add, I mean, it's even made even more complicated by the fact in, in, in Auckland, we have also a regional fuel tax, um, which the Independent Māori Statutory Board did some analysis on and, um, you know, did e expect that it does have a regressive effect on low income households and, um, and especially with a disproportionate effect for, for Māori households. Um, and, you know, we, we may well see the phase out of that fuel tax in recent years with um, congestion charging, which is now increasingly on the table as an alternative. But um, I just highlight the issue that this also <laughs> requires this um, joined up thinking about some of these distributional impacts as well. And, and, you know, certainly the solutions are there, but they need to be built into the policy. Um, Tanya, I, I want to talk, turn to, to, to some of your work. Um, you know, you know, we've we've just been talking about some of the unequal distribution of the costs, especially through these pricing mechanisms, the fuel taxes, the emissions trading scheme, and so on. But on the flip side, there's also opportunities um, here. The low emissions transition is not just about cost, and it is about economic activity, just in a different direction. And that's been um, really reinforced by the Climate Change Commission um, recently and its economic analysis, which is consistent with international analysis too. Uh, it involves new infrastructure, 
new innovation, new economic opportunities and new jobs. However, these can also be unequally, unevenly distributed if there's not some consideration taken to um, you know, which regions benefit the most from this low emissions transition. So you've talked a lot in your work with the Southern and Western initiatives about the opportunity for a green new deal. And, and I'd really love for you to um, talk us through what that means for Tamaki Makoto. Mm. So um, um, we were really uh, influenced by the Green New Deal movements from around the world and more so the more radical Green New Deals, like for example, the Red Deal, which is from the perspective of um, native and queer uh, people, people's quantitative of easing, which is a very kind of working class focused um, Green New Deal. And what we see is the opportunity through that is for ruptural change, to completely change the, the metabolism between, you know, labour, capital and the natural world, and an opportunity for us to rejig the relationship between nation state markets and citizens. So, um, you know, not just um, decarbonising um, things, but actually an opportunity to, to have an economy of mana, as um, the late, you know, Professor Manu Kahenare would have advocated for. One that upholds the mana of ordinary people and the natural world, all at, all at the same time. And so I think it's those, um, that's, that for us is the, um, the, um, the, the opportunity that a Green New Deal um, offers. In terms of what, ha so those, those are all fine words, but it has to be translated, right, into practical, meaningful, tangible action that makes a difference to people's lives on the ground. Otherwise, it's just rhetoric. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of really looking at what is the role that we can play in market shaping. It is a lever that we have as the public sector. So Auckland Council, for example, spends three and a half billion dollars a year buying stuff. That's a lot of buying power. Central government, you know, kind of is up there in 40 to 50 billion dollars a year buying stuff. So that's a, a lever that we could be pulling really easily and, and straight away. Um, and how, how might we you know, yeah, re really use our market shaping ability um, for distribution and equity rather than we have used our market shaping lever, but it has tended almost always to be for the benefit of the big end of town. How do we have a more mixed economy? So in one of the projects that we're doing, we're looking at how we can most effectively incentivize things like worker-owned cooperatives and mutual aids, for example. Um, what I really love about the Green New Deal is, is, is that idea going back to Roosevelt's New Deal of the, the Great Depression. And it was the massive mobilization of pragmatic and experimental investment. And I think all of those words, massive, mobilized, pragmatic and ex, um, experimental is the key to how we create uh, macroeconomic policy right through to you know the microeconomic um, things about configuring urban um, town centres, for example, um, and, and then the muscle in between. And so we are looking at what is our role as the entrepreneurial public sector in accelerating this and turbocharging this. And I think I would say, thank God this isn't the Great Depression or World War II, because we would never have gotten things like, you know, a New Deal. Half of all trees that exist in America today were planted by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, the Federal Writers Program, um, you know, employed 10,000 unemployed writers and editors and filmmakers and librarians. Um, and then they were sent out to record the lives of ordinary Americans um, in the depression. And one of the things that I really love, and I got to see, see this in action, is that um, Roosevelt sent them out to record the testimonies of the last African-Americans who were emancipated from slavery. So to record their testimonies of what it was like to be born and raised in such brutality. 
what an incredible foresight. If we didn't have those 2,000 testimonies, how deniable would it have been around the, 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 you know, the horrendous genocidal um, driver of, of slavery? It, those experiences would have been invisible and therefore much more likely to be deniable. Oh, it wouldn't have been that bad. So that took a really amazing and entrepreneurial public sector to do that. It's not like Roosevelt was out there recruiting all the, you know, the artists. Um, here in, in Aotearoa, Mickey Savage and the, the welfare state, state housing, that has paid forward a million times in raising living standards for ordinary working class families. Although I must, must um, um, uh, state that Māori were not entitled to that until 1948. So that's a, that's a mistake to never repeat. Um, the NHS, Nye Bevan's NHS after World War II, you know, an economy that had been completely crippled and comes out with this, you know, the, the most life-changing thing in the whole of the UK. So that's what we're really focused on. I have a concern that um, the public sector has been dumbed down and it is no longer possible of such great things. We are more of a technocratic and administrative public service. So we are really reaching back into those into those historical um, archives to understand what it is that we will need to do in order to deliver such transformational change at scale as those things did. And part of our Green New Deal, it's not just about bread, it has to be about roses too. So we consider things like the creative economy to be part of uh, our new low emissions um, economy. It's not just about decarbonizing the bad stuff, it's also about promoting and better value of the good stuff that's already low carbon. Caring and creativity are two of those. Thank you. Um, you I, mean, I mean, some of these conversations have been um, Coming back up again in the wake of the of the pandemic, you know, the the call to to build back better, um, especially last year. I, I note that I haven't heard so much of that in recent weeks, even though you know potentially it's even more disruptive this time around, which perhaps um, gives a sense of, <laughs> of of sort of apathy and pessimism about our own capacity to embrace this. Um, Opportunity, um, you know, you know, I think I think there's been examples of that. You mentioned the con conservation cause. You know, you know, there has been that. You know, above one billion dollars put into the jobs for for nature program, which I know has been, um, you know, well received in 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 some areas and in some some communities. But um, you know, can I just can I just um put a little factoid in there? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so $1.3 please. billion dollars of economic stimulus, not one cent has yet to reach South Auckland, which is ground zero, be under no illusion, right? Mm -hmm. South Auckland is bigger than the cities of Dunedin and Hamilton and Wellington. Um, there are more Pacifica people in just Māngari than there are in the entire Wellington region. Not one cent yep. has yet to hit the back pockets of a South Aucklander. And this is, uh, this is part of the challenge that we face. There is, a, there is a perception of anyone else but Auckland. And this type of mahi around the just transitions, and you pointed it out, the regional impacts, um, that's how it has panned out. Not one cent of tailored economic stimulus and response for rebuilding has come to, has come to South Auckland. And that's a, that's, that is a test of our moral compass. This is not an issue of finance. It is a test of morality simply unacceptable to red zone a quarter of all Māori and 64% of all Pacifica people in this country. So there's a lot of work, there's a big lift yeah. um, that needs to be done. Yeah, and and I mean, just to add another dimension to this is, um, you know, even if that infrastructure money comes um, or, or, you know, public investment into things like an infrastructure that, that, that might be, of, of benefit and create economic opportunities um, for, for those communities. There's still a question about whether we can be strategic enough as a nation to make sure that those investments are 
go, contributing to the low emissions transition rather than baking in yeah. the high emission status quo. And um, you know, certainly myself and, and Nina Ives, who I saw on this call, we've been working with an international group um, energy policy tracker to to analyze you know the proportion of that public investment. Um, and you know, we find that more um, slightly more than half of it has gone towards what we might describe as clean energy. Um, projects, but still almost half of it is, um, you know, $1.15 billion has gone towards infrastructure and public investments that prop up the high, high emissions economy. Um, I mean, I mean is, there, is there any easy way for, you know, um, the, the, the decision makers to be more um, discerning and discriminating over where this public investment goes to. I mean, obviously, last year in the rush of trying to, you know, stop the financial the, the, the huge financial crunch that was happening, you know, a lot of money had to be thrown into the economy in a, in a rather crude fashion. Um, but, you know, as this rolls on, we really ought to be more strategic about where that money goes and how, to, how do we do that? And every cent that is spent needs to be squeezed, you know. It needs to deliver both environmental and socioeconomic equity um, and um, justice. So one of the things that we are um, putting forward for, in, the, in the advent that central government has just kind of seemingly red zoned, um, you know, a population of 320,000, you know, half a million if you include West Auckland, um, we thought we're going to have to do this ourselves. The tsunami is coming and it appears that people are just milling around on the shoreline with a sandbag and a whistle. We need to be getting people on the bus to get them inland and up the hill and that's not happening. So um, we, so we are very focused on how do, how do we make this an opportunity for generating and distributing wealth in communities. So for example, we're not, we're not really up for the planting trees. That's, that didn't work in the 80s, and it sure as hell ain't going to make us more economic resilient, economically resilient in the future. That's a, you know, e koreana te pātiki, you know, the, the, the flounder doesn't go back to where it just where it got killed from. It's not dumb. So learn from our mistakes. So one of the things that we are, um, our big flagship project is around how do we turbocharge the circular economy here in Tāmaki um, with Māori and Pacifica innovators at the helm. And um, so that's a really big investment for us, about 120 million. And we also need to leverage private investment five to 10 times that as well. Yeah. Um, but that's the, that's the level of aspiration. That is the audacity that is going to be needed. Um, anything less, you're just mucking around the edges. Yeah. And yeah. You're, you're simply not going to get there. Catherine, do, do you have anything to add to this question as to how we, we, we get more strategic um, about where that public investment goes? And I, and, and I know I want to link this to your policy quarterly article that you co-wrote with um, Dominique White, because in there you describe a framework um, that helps to identify groups that have reduced resilience to the low emissions transition and its effects. And so, you know, a framework like this, I'd love for you to explain to us how that might help to identify those groups who might benefit most from this sort of public investment, and then perhaps to give us a sense of what sort of policy levers are available to support those groups. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I do want to acknowledge um, Dominic's work in this area. Um, the uh, the, the policy research that we did was around trying to improve the policymaking process to, to, so that these better decisions happen in central government and, and in local government as well. And um, so when we're designing policies, I mean, a key starting point is obviously to understand how the impacts of those policies are gonna be distributed and the distributional issues that Tanya is raising really, really, really important. I mean, if huge communities are being left out of these opportunities that needs to be identified. But that's enough, not enough by itself. We also need to understand how the communities are going to respond to those impacts. And that's a function of how sensitive they are to those impacts, how exposed they are to those impacts, and then their ability to adapt to those impacts. Do they have the capability and the resources to do something about it? 
So the work that, that Dom and I did together was about proposing um, an assessment framework for social resilience to change that looks across these factors and says, okay, these are the types of impacts, but how are communities actually going to respond? And it's both looking at areas where there may be um, weak resilience that needs to be strengthened, but also building on the existing strengths. And like Tanya was just um, highlighting the importance of, um, of encouraging the, the Maori and Pacifica in entrepreneurialism. For example, that would be a resilience strategy that, that we need to acknowledge here. When can they respond in, in this way? So some of the key considerations we might want to look like and look at in a framework like that are things like occupation, economic status, the social and cultural identity, um, your level of civic participation, having a voice in the process, education, um, health related um, factors and disabilities, infrastructure access and age, thinking about future generations that don't have any voice in the process, as well as the ones that, that, that we're dealing with here, and crafting that some, some kind of an assessment framework. And this is just a, con a concept that really needs to be developed further, but we think that there's a lot of, of promise in this area. We also need to do a better job of creating indicators for setting targets and measuring our progress. You know, We don't really have a measure for what low emission climate resilient well-being looks like. And, and I'm intrigued by the, you know, the concept of the donut that Kate Rayworth develops, where we look at how do we meet socioeconomic needs within planetary limits? And how do we create indicators for low emission well-being? What's a bundle of the basic needs that people have and thinking about the emissions that they require in order to have those needs met? Um, so better systems for, um, for, for, for understanding what good progress looks like. You know, through the living standards framework, we've got a list of indicators, but we don't have a measure of success. And we, we know we're not succeeding now and the COVID situation is, is making things worse. Um, you know, in terms of the levers that government has to, to make this work better, um, well, one of them is really better collaboration and partnership in how decisions get made. And that can happen at the local level and, and at the national level. Um, the second is better processes for systematic measurement, monitoring and review. We just don't have enough information. I mean, look at the research that you're doing to understand where the infrastructure spending is going. We don't have enough information available on how we're doing the impact that we're having and, and where continual improvement might lie. Um, the third is really taking an integrated approach that looks across policy silos. And we tend to only think about mitigation and ignore adaptation. And, and not think about the stacking of impacts on some of our most vulnerable communities um, across climate change impacts and then adaptation policies, mitigation policies, other economic policies, now the effect of COVID. We really need to be looking at all of these things together about how we safeguard well being. So we need this integrated approach. And when we're looking at solutions, we need to look beyond climate policy. I think that's a lot of what Tanya is pointing at. We need to be remedying issues across the boards. So we need to be looking at social assistance, but also tax policy, education and training and regional economic development. All of these things need to be developed together in order to move us you know, in, in the right direction. And then I think the, the, the final lever is really giving effect to the principles of Te Piriti and looking at what a, a, a genuine partnership approach looks like as we, as we deal with these challenges at, at different levels. So I think those are the levers that I see as the most um, promising for, for moving together. And, you know, and just in relation to the conversation you're just having with Tanya, I'll just refer you again to the six principles that the Climate Change Commission put forward for directing some of the, the, um, the investment. And you know, this thing about doing it in partnership in, around how these priorities get set. Um, one of the other really powerful tools is applying a really high shadow carbon price to these investments. So that if these are not going to make sense in the long term from a climate perspective, their business case should be ruled out. They should not be considered profitable if, if this is credit card spending with the environment. So we need to, to be taking that into account. And so, so somebody's mentioned as well in the in the chat, um, you know, are, are there really clear international examples of just transitions that we could take inspiration from of, of how to do well? Um, there are there are really interesting examples that are emerging. Um, in, in many countries. And some of the initial research that we've done at Motu has identified a few. Some of them are listed in our policy quarterly paper. And we're actually coming out with a complementary paper that presents more of our, of our just transition search. Um, there are communities that have tried to coordinate things around the fossil fuel transitions so that um, across multiple producers, for example, 
companies will coordinate on who's ready to retire and then shift workers toward the remaining plant so things shut down in stages. Also looking at how you coordinate education and training so that people are prepared to move into a new job when their old job is starting to transition out. So there are, there are concrete examples of communities that have tried to do this um, you know, in, in Australia, in Germany, um, I, th I think, uh, and in other um, countries, I, when specific this specific question comes up, my mind always goes blank. So I have to come back to uh, to the more specifics that are in the literature and encourage the person to get in touch. We'd be happy to put through some of some of those examples. I think there's also really interesting examples from government. You know, the, um, Wales has a Future Generations Act, which had a, a major impact on changing their transport um, policy decisions because the government tried to do something that came back. No, actually, that's not consistent with what's needed for future generations. And so there's some really interesting policy solutions there. I think Scotland is doing some interesting things in the just transition space as well. So there, I think they're really interesting examples coming out of both government and business uh, about how to do this at, at a local level. I always get stumped by the um, case study question too, and I think it, it speaks partly to the unprecedented and, and unique nature of what we're going through, that everywhere around the world is really um, going on this journey together in, in a unique way to undertake an energy transition and a technological revolution in a purposeful, intentful way, not just by accident, which is more or less how you know, some previous industrial revolutions um, have happened. Um, Somebody here is also mentioning um, co-design, and that and that brings me, you know, to the question really about um, procedural justice, because you know we often focus on the substantive side of justice, and our conversation today has mostly been on that. But the other dimension of of justice is is pro process, procedure. How do we make sure that we make the decisions in a just fashion, and that being its own dimension of fairness um, and justice. And I mean, I mean let, let's just put it bluntly, you know, it, is our representative democracy at both the local and, and national levels failing us in, in regard to this? And, and, you know, there's this conversation emerging that perhaps we need to find new ways, democratic innovations, citizen, citizens assemblies, other more participatory, um, ways of making these decisions together. I know that you've got strong thoughts on this, Tanya, so maybe you could um, address the question or the issue. Uh, I, I think that's a really exciting, you know, I, I, um, we are on the cusp of so many exciting things and how how might we grow participatory democracy is, is one of those things. Um, there is no doubt that, um, We've got a lot of work to do. If we want the people who have been at the worst end of the economy um, being able to kind of like be part of that decision-making machinery. So, the, you know, we focus on three things, decent livelihoods, growing community wealth, but what actually really matters is power because, you know, these choices are made and trade-offs are made. So, for example, you can either tax Food through through GST, or you can tax wealth. That's a that's a that's a that's a choice, and it's a choice that is influenced by our um, what we feel the moral compass is of of the country and of voters. So, um, I think there's so many opportunities for citizen assemblies for um, for more kind of co-production. And that would require people in power giving up some of their power in order to do that um, truly, genuinely, authentically. Um, so I've seen a lot of stuff being called co-design and it's not, it's just kind of um, more earnest consult consultation. Um, real co-production requires um, there to be a complete blurring of lines between experts and end users or end recipients. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity here for us to be developing public policy that is kind of more robust because it is more democratised and, and these processes can also get captured. So no, there is no silver bullet, there is nothing is ever foolproof. But one of the things that um, you know, we're really interested in is how do we create 
create how do we create conditions and that might be policy conditions um, it might be very practical conditions um, for example around um, how the financial sector lends money that democratizes wealth and um, builds back the commons um, we have a situation now where you know really incredibly important human rights are subject entirely to market forces, energy, housing. Thank God, you know, our health system hasn't been privatised. But, you know, we, we, we need to be on guard for these things. Digital um, access, entirely privatised. How do we bring some of those things that are basic human rights back into the commons so that they are working for the good of, um, of all people? And also, how do we democratize? How do we have a greater, um, a more diverse market of different types of business ownership? Which is why we're, um, you know, kind of really backing things like uh, worker-owned cooperatives, the, the most kind of, you know, democratized thing that you can have. And I think, um, to your point about, you know, the case study, we haven't found one. All we've found is different people doing amazing things and trying to bring. Um, all together how do we how do we knit beauty with industry how do we knit profit with democratized ownership of capital um and so we're reaching into all of the these amazing examples both here and overseas and and trying our best to to knit all of those things together so that we can have maximum net effect yeah, I think there's a really interesting role for intermediaries in the transition and bringing groups together and playing that um, role of convening and, and joining dots. But Catherine, I just want to turn to you for the final word. I know that the Climate Change Commission had submissions um, that, you know, there was consultation exhaustion and also, you know, this, again, this, this wish for more um, deliberative ways of addressing these issues including the role of citizens of assemblies. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on these on these issues. Sure, thank you. Um, I really appreciate, uh, Tanya, your reflections on this. Uh, I, I think there's enormous opportunity in, um, in this space and we've got to figure out how to do it better and we need to be willing to experiment and 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 really try to you know at, at different levels and see what we can do certainly um and, and we heard that message very clearly um during before and during consultation um the commission's advice included a recommendation um calling for inclusive and more inclusive and effective consultation engagement and participation uh, we had really interesting discussions within the commission and during consultation on on citizens assemblies and um giving a voice to youth and you know how, how can we do this better and we didn't have the, the time and the resourcing to, to go into deeper, recommending really deeper solutions at this stage, just more to point to the direction of policy, which is we've got to find better ways to bring voices into this process. And, um, and there are things that we can do in the existing system to make the current system more effective. And then there's things I think we can start building in and we need to move on both fronts um, so that progress can, can be accelerated. Uh, I, I think a key element here is, is education and training so that people have the information that they need um, to bring their values and their needs into the conversation and be able to influence decision making. Um, the other a, a big problem I, I, I perceive is, is that, you know, for, for those of us who work as public servants, you know, we, we get paid to do this and yet communities are expected to co-design on their own time and their own money. And so I think we need to find better ways of giving people the resources to contribute. I mean, it is a public service for communities to be engaged in code in co-design. And, and we need to find better ways to reward that. So I, I don't have the answer to how this works. Um, I love reading visionary books on how to transform um, democracy and how to transform our economic production. Uh, we also face the challenge of having to start from where we are. And um, we have to start improving things wherever we can starting now. So I, I think there is a lot that we can do in the current system and we can keep exploring these opportunities to transition. Um, yeah. Catherine, Tanya, thank you so much. Um,